Good evening. I'd like to welcome the right to the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees, Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. Today is Tuesday, September 19th. And I ask for a call to order. Mr. Kayleen? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Here. Mr. Quadro? Present. Mayor Ciara? Here. And Dr. Bonner will be a little bit late. Okay. And we all stand for a pledge of allegiance. Mission statement, <clears throat> Smith Vocational Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Is there any participation by the public tonight? Hearing none. Participation by the trustees? Well, only to say that the um, the pictures of our students um, testifying on Beacon Hill made me have all the feelings. It was just it was awesome. I had a long time social studies teacher, so seeing them exercise their civic responsibility, tremendous. Um, so great for um, the folks who are advocating for that bill to hear directly from the young people who will be impacted by it. So, really cool. So, that's the hoisting. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Mr. Quadro, anything? Um, no. I will report under committee, right. committee reports. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the August 15, 2023 Board of Trustees meeting. So moved. Second. I have just a couple um, things that I noted. I think on the um, second page it says, yeah, on the second page of the top, in the top left, I think it's supposed to say um, Mr. Kalian instead of Reed Chilling. And then, um, I think it's just a typo. Um, and then where the, uh, moving to the electronic process, it was, um, so it said that it was tabled, but it was a tie vote. So only to correct that. Okay. Any questions, Doug? All in favor? Aye. 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 So at this point, I'll turn over to Amy for a spotlight. Sure, so uh, this month's spotlight, uh, as we've done in the last few years, to highlight adult ed, so Lorena Turner, our adult ed director. Thank you. I just have something to pass out to everybody. So I just did a little chart here, um, just an overview of how we did this semester. Um, this fall, 2023, we uh, have 144 students enrolled, and um, we finished with, you know, um, after we paid teacher stipends, after we paid supplies and, and books and everything that we had to pay, we finished out at $121,865.88. Um, of course, that does fluctuate because we do have some more um, courses that we're enrolling in, like woodworking. Um, we could possibly end up getting one more for uh, welding or um, even oil heat technician. Those courses start next week and the week after. So um, that could change a little bit. Um, 
but um, what I'd like to do is kind of compare fall with fall and also the year. So because the year started in spring of 2023 in January, um, so spring we ended with $82,969. Um, which is actually a very good number for spring. Um, you know, we had, we had nurse aid, which is spring only, um, and that's what I get for an oversight there, so we added that in. Um, so it, it did pretty good. Um, fall of 2022, um, we actually finished at 88,000, so for that to jump to 121, is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of factors there, and that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, but first, I I would like to um, introduce my um, Question adult ed. You oh yeah, forward, sure. Please. When you say finish out, is this money you made? Or? Right after okay. we take out uh, teacher stipends, yep. after we take out books and certification exams, supplies that we need, all that kind of stuff, that's where we finish. So we actually, okay. you know, we make more, but we want to account that mm -hmm. that's really not ours, all of it, right? Um, so I thought that's a more clean number. Um, but um, since we were growing, I um, back in the beginning of the spring of last, um, you know, uh, semester, I had mentioned I really need help. It's getting really hard, you know, to manage the uh, the adult ed by myself. Um, and and I was very grateful that um, everybody agreed that um, we could hire. So um, we created a position, the adult ed coordinator position. Um, after interviewing, we selected Sarah, Sarah De Maria, and um, so far she uh, started um, April fourth. I remember that because that's my birthday, <laughs> and um, and she's been really fantastic. Uh, Sarah learns quickly. Um, she's very smart. She's very good with um, interacting with um, students um, and teachers, and so we're really happy to. I'm very happy to <coughs> um, have her join me. Um, it's nice to have someone to uh, be able to talk about problems, uh, come up with solutions and everything. Um, so I'm really happy to have Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so uh, what's new about this semester? I think uh, a main reason why we kind of jumped a little bit for uh, where we finished is all because of, mostly because of Cooley Dickinson. Um, a field coordinator from the union over there called me and she said to me, you know, we normally have STIC uh, train our students, but we were, some, one of your graduates suggested that we look into you. Um, she trained in phlebotomy and, um, you know, can you tell me a little bit about what you have to offer? And so I sold our um, phlebotomy program and uh, so what we did is we agreed she was going to recruit people. Who are these people? Um, these are Cooley Dickinson Hospital employees that either maybe work in environmental, which means they clean the hospital. Maybe they're in the cafeteria. Maybe they're patient care techs. Um, and the notice goes out to all the employees who would like to train for phlebotomy and she recruits and so she spent the summer from july to the end of august recruiting recruiting and part of that recruiting uh, what she asked me to do is zoom presentations i did four um, each time with new students who wanted to know a little bit about the program and what it involved um, you know, it was a very good thing because a lot of times people don't know what they're getting into when they enroll in phlebotomy. You know, I've heard things like, wait, we're going to be working with blood. We're actually going <laughs> to, we're going to be um, drawing on each other, that kind of stuff. Well, yes. You know, I, I've had a student say to me, well, I thought we were just going to poke oranges. <laughs> you know, so it's really important that we do those Zooms and explain what kind of things you're going to learn and what would you expect coming out of this program, what kind of job would you expect to, to gain? And, um, you know, what are the salaries uh, for new phlebotomists? All these kind of things that should 
playing a role in deciding whether or not you should enroll into a program like this. And so um, our goal was 15, to, to recruit 15 students, but we ended up getting 12. And I like that because I know that the 12 really um, had an informed decision on enrolling in Fubani and figured that this is something I really want to try, want to do. Um, I said to this field coordinator, her name is Judith Lorai, I said, um, we would be uh, open to, if this goes well, um, to possibly doing a different kind of training like medical assisting. Um, and she thought that was a great idea. So we're going to see how it goes. She's coming in on Tuesday night of next week to uh, pop into the class to introduce herself because she's, you know, she works virtually. So those people who have contacted with her um, know her through Zoom. So she, they're actually going to meet her for the first time, even though they're Cooley employees. And she's going to meet me in person um, Tuesday night. So I look forward to that, and I look forward to building a relationship to see if like this can become a different, you know, like a nice um, extra for us. Um, she does not want for our classes that we enroll with um, the public to uh, mesh with hers. We have to do a separate training for the Cooley Hospital, uh, which is fine. So medical assisting will be a little tricky because we, you know, phlebotomy is two nights a week. That's easy. We'll just do the other two nights a week because we do Monday through Thursday. But with medical assisting, I would really have to look into rearranging a schedule where we can make those three nights a week, two nights a week, but longer um, in hours and see if I can pull off a Monday, Tuesday, and then a Wednesday, Thursday. So there's still talk. It's not secure. Um, it's not a definite, but it is something that we're exploring at this point. And if we do end up going through with it, it's going to be pretty good um, for our spring um, outcomes. And then I just wanted to uh, mention some other changes. Sometimes they're, they're good, um, good things that happen. Sometimes, unfortunately, are kind of sad. Like, we are retiring some courses. Um, we are no longer going to be offering the nurse aid. That was a collaboration with Center for New Americans. It was a grant-funded program through DESE with the American, uh, the Center for New Americans. Um, they did a six-year <coughs> grant. It, we just completed in the spring, we just completed the sixth year. It's done. Um, she decided, and when I say she, it's um, Lori Millman, the director of Center for New Americans, decided that um, it was very difficult taking people who don't speak English very well, um, that can't read and write very well, putting them through this kind of a program and expecting them to pass the nurse aid test, um, which of course is a written and a, a skills test. They did really well with the skills test. Unfortunately, with the written, um, they always struggled, so it was a matter of retaking and retaking and retaking until they can finally pass. Um, so they're going to be, you know, sitting around the table figuring out other things. The way I left it with Lori is I felt like this was a great relationship we had. Um, I was here for five out of the six years, and um, I encouraged her to uh, contact me if she could uh, come up with something different that we can collaborate with, and she really appreciated that. Furthermore, I said to her that um, our programs are open to everybody, and if she ever had anybody, um, if they didn't even, if they didn't speak the language, we would see what we could do to offer support um, for a training program, for example, like the culinary, which I'll get into in a minute. So we, we left them good terms, and you know we're just hoping that maybe we can continue at a further time with Center for New Americans. Um, home repair, um, that gentleman, a lot of you guys know, Stan the Fix-It Man here mm -hmm. in Northampton, mm -hmm. um, uh, had taught for us many years in the adult ed. He also used to be a substitute teacher here um, at Smith Folk. Um, he is getting up there in age, uh, and in his high 70s, he decided that it's just time for him to retire. So um, I wished him a lot of luck. and. Um, and that was a very popular course. He tried to help me find someone to replace him, but we just, we can't find another Stan. 
And then uh, social dance, um, that was pretty popular when I first came here. Um, they would take the cafeteria, our custodians would move all of the tables, and we had a lot of people um, on the older side that would join us, and um, they just enjoyed an evening of just dancing. They did salsa, they did uh, East Coast Swing, West Coast Swing, um, all sorts of different um, neat dance classes. So what happened is over the years, year after year after year, it was the same people, the same people that would join, and they did it to, you know, to have something to do, a social thing and everything, but it was those same dance classes. So um, eventually it just got too much. How many times can you take East Coast Swing? How many times can you take Salsa? Um, so uh, Emily, uh, she, her, she just decided I need to move to somewhere else and gain new um, clientele. So she did, and now she's at Greenfield Community College, and she's um, teaching those classes there with, you know, maybe a fresh um, set of people. Um, hoisting, we decided um, it wasn't really um, something that we made money on at all. Um, it was hard getting people to join. What's what's wrong with hoisting? Well. The thing is, if you need your hoisting certification or uh, continuing ed, you can just do that online. So most people do it online. We just have some people that just did like to come in person, but not enough to make it go. Plus, we had a little issue with the state where the state said, well, hold on, Smith is not, um, not approved to be teaching that, and then we had to go through um, the instructor <coughs> was Mike Flor Florio um, had to settle that with the state um, because he's technically his own um, institution. Um, so it was a little too complicated. It wasn't worth our time to, to continue hoisting, but um, I, I appreciated that you know we had it those years that we did. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to talk about the CTI grant. Um, everybody knows we applied for a CTI grant and we decided um, that it was going to be culinary. So culinary, um, we, when we got the grant round six, we started our first cohort. Round six was made up of two cohorts. Spring, uh, which started in January and ended in June. Um, and then now, this is our second cohort. We just started yesterday, and we should be ending in January, and that concludes round six. Um, we learned a lot from round six, uh, the first cohort. We, we definitely learned a lot. Um, screening um, students to make sure that their ultimate goal is um, uh, job placement and not, oh, that's so, I'm so, so fun to learn how to do different things and cook um, and not have any intention to actually work. Um, that's a no-no. That's not what this is for. The state's paying a lot of money for people to train to go to work. So to actually have, uh, I think we, you know, we started off with 11. We ended up with uh, uh, graduating six students. And out of those six students, I can only say two are working, so that's not what we want. Um, we tried all summer really hard to really recruit the right candidate. Um, it's not easy. For some reason, you would think that um, a free program, everybody would be jumping at it. Um, it's very difficult. And I, I try not to take things personally because I, I really tried my best. Um, but. Franklin County Tech, they also applied for a CTI grant and they had to delay their programs because they didn't have enough students. Um, Mass Hire did um, the CNC program, which is a machining program that was supposed to start in September, but they had to delay it because they didn't have enough people. These are free programs. And these are, um, you would think that you would have people lining up at the door, but it's not the case. And unfortunately, they don't know what they're missing because we provide everything. We provide uniforms, shoes, a knife set. We pay them to go on externship. 
um, for the week, one week. We help them with job placement. It's a very important thing um, that we place them. We have a lot of partners. We've increased our partners. We have like, I don't know, Sarah, about 10, 12, something yeah, like that. Yeah, we only needed three. We have yeah, we only nine. needed three to submit the grant, and <coughs> we have so many. Um, so there's so many opportunities knocking at our door for these people. Um, so we hope that uh, the word gets out and it just we do end up increasing um, the amount of people um, that want to participate in this program. So, um, so we did apply in the spring, Sarah and I. Sarah was brand new, and I said, hey, how about like helping me write a grant? <laughs> She's like, I've never done it before. I'm like, I never either, so <laughs> let's just do it. Um, and luckily, we had a lot of when the grant was written for round six, so we were able to uh, piggyback on that and um, we just recently found out that we were awarded round eight which will consist of three cohorts um, so we start in the spring of 2024 then we'll do a 2024 fall and then a 2025 spring and that will conclude round eight if there's more uh, rounds for us to apply we plan on applying and continuing it as long as we can because we do see this as a beneficial thing. Um, and I do believe that it benefits our Culinary Day High School too. Um, you know, Nelson has been great with being a coordinator and he's very, very organized with um, ordering our supplies, our food, all that kind of stuff. And um, so yeah, that's that's about it. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes? I wanted to uh, personally say that I had to go to get a lab test at my local uh, medical facility. Yes. And when the young lady is putting the stick in my arm, uh, I asked her where she went to school. And she said she went to Smith Vocational Adult Ed. Yeah. Didn't yeah. hurt me one bit. Right. She got a gold star from me. <laughs> and I want to pass it on oh, to you. Thank you so much. You guys did a great job. And I thank just want to say, um, I, I also uh, recently just talked to a higher up at Mass Hire. She's one that signs contracts, not the one that you do, Crystal, but like the one with the students and stuff that's saying, yes, you can <coughs> secure your place at Smith Oak. And she said to me that she acknowledges that um, the um, that the students graduating from our program getting jobs is very well known. Um, so uh, especially now that we started medical assisting, it's even like taking off even more. If you take a look at this chart and you see like the um, you know the the amount that it's increasing, it's it's pretty impressive. Um, and they are getting jobs. So I'm really proud of that, and um, that it's our number one. Yes. Um, I have a couple questions, and want to echo also the it's wonderful to hear about the success of the program, and I think it's a symbiotic relationship for sure. Thank like you. The reputation of Smith Oak helps the adult ed program, and the reputation of the adult ed program helps the I, school. And I do help. believe that too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Yes. Um, so my questions are, uh, am I right in remembering that those numbers that we see at the bottom, those are what make the program self-sufficient? Correct. Yeah, that yeah. Is, that's awesome. Yeah, that absolutely. Self-sustaining program. Yeah, yeah. It, um, you know, some of these things, like if you look at welding, spring 2023, you probably ask me, like, what's going on? You only made $28. Mm -hmm. Well, what you have to understand is we actually had 13 students. Each student paid $2,000 each. Wow. We made a lot of money. Yeah. The thing is, we're investing. Yeah. We're investing in the program. Yeah. So I bought three sheds, and of course, Smith uh, Vocational High School students built them for us, so we're really proud of that. Yeah. Um, we bought more welding. Uh, machines we you know we bought a lot of consumables that now were good even for this semester um, so you know you know a lot of these things we we take things and we invest it because we know that they will produce for us yeah, so, the, the program yeah is so popular absolutely yeah. yeah so my other question is um, you know uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital is such a great community partner in, in so many ways um, you said that it was the field coordinator from the union. Is that the yes. SCIU? 
I, I want to say yes. So, yeah. so the union recruit, I, I just they I want pay, the dots they, connected a little bit. So the union recruits Cooley Dickinson staff to participate in the courses. Right, and they pay for it. Yeah, yeah. So they that's have not funds. coming from the hospitals, coming from SIU. the union. Yeah. yeah, and also, I mean, we're this very pro union here yeah. at Smith Vocational, with so many of our students going into unions themselves right. when they graduate. Yeah. Um, so I, that's that's just really interesting. Yeah. It's a nice, um, nice. You know, we we were the underdog, and you know everybody knows stick. Yeah. Um, and you know it's like some kind of like seal of approval with stick, but what. People don't know what I'm trying to get the word out because when people even come, even let's say for mass hire, yeah. they have to bring a sheet where they're comparing two schools. And they have uh, pros and cons for each school. And they always go to stick first and it's their first choice. Yeah. And I I win a lot of them over because what I say to them is if you go to stick um, for the phlebotomy, you're going to touch the needle five times in the course. If you're lucky, anywhere from three to five times, you're going to be able to stick someone three to five times. And then you're going to go out on externship and do all your sticks. But um, with us, we invest in all that those supplies, and they come out of here 35 to 40 sticks. And it pays off. And then they go do an externship with Cooley and do another 70. And then on their resume, what I tell them is when you put down that you have plus a hundred sticks, yeah. you're now now employers are looking at you because before, you know, coming out with just a few sticks yeah. and trying to get a job, no one's gonna hire. Yeah. It's so, such a very concrete data point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I try to like, you know, um, sell that and I and I think that's how I sold um, that woman, that yeah. field coordinator. Yeah. I said you realize the difference between, you know, stick um, the course, because I know it. I know what they do. Our teacher used to be an assistant teacher there, yeah. um, and she knows the difference. Yeah. So, you know, I, I try to find out as much as possible about these other schools, these competitors. I want to know how are we different yeah. and, um, Good and sell it. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Excellent yes. questions. Yeah. Um, all right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. You made the example of the uh, welding that money you made on welding, you invested in other equipment. Yes. So all these positives have some money reinvested in that program, and then you still end up with a net balance, right? A net profit, say. Yes. So what happens with the net profit money? So it just sits in the account <laughs> until you well, find I mean, something that, else to Crystal invest in. Well, I mean, Crystal could probably, um, you know, explain more. But it's my understanding that account helps pay my salary, Sarah's salary. That's not taken into these numbers already. Um, no. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. And, and if I may, um, yeah. when Lorena started, um, the account was. Um, the funds were borrowed from the trustees. Yeah. So since Lorraine has been here, she has been able to pay back both of the um, loans. The borrow. Correct. Mm -hmm. So she's continuing to build, and I know she works closely with Joe and on different ideas of how they can put into Great. the program and for the our um, regular students. Now, yeah. one silly question. <laughs> Where does the term cohorts come from? From the grant. Um, the grant that, considers cohorts. That's um, a term. The term meeting it's class. Meeting class. Meeting yeah. Semester. Yeah. yeah. Right. So a, a couple. Okay. Okay. Kind of like a semester, right? Yeah. yeah. It's an educational. Lot. Yeah. Right. So well, it's new. It's new yeah. to me. I know, <laughs> and I'm used to it from the school that I used to work yeah. at. But it basically says the the <clears> group <throat> of people that start and finish at mm -hmm. the same time. We'll call them a cohort. Okay. And um, okay, and you. so we, you know, when we apply for the grant, we're letting them know how many of them we can have and how many do we expect in each semester. For example, we said 10 for each semester. For each cohort, we, do, we want 10. Did we end up with 10 this time around? No, we ended up with 8, but it was the minimum for us to start. Great. So hopefully we'll end the 8, too. So. But that's a good question, Rick. Yeah. I like that. that yeah, absolutely. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you.
Have a great this evening. Time we'll have a superintendent's report. Thank you. Good evening, board. So, uh, as we talked about last month, we sort of changed up the tempo a little bit. And uh, this month, I also added just the, the language around. <coughs> Each of the standards. So, as trustees again adhere to the end of the year, uh, these reports will become evidence uh, for the superintendent evaluation. It may just be nice to, to see the language behind what is instructional leadership. So, back to sort of the question of what is a cohort. Uh, the question might be what is, you know, what is what is instructional leadership, and you'll see that uh, in, in other future slides as well. So, I won't read that, but you'll see it. That's why I'll list it there. Hopefully, make your life easier when it comes to the springtime. So, this past month, I just wanted to highlight. Uh, an academic review schedule and a vocational review schedule. This is sort of a, an initiative that Desi uh, sort of unveiled a few years ago. And Joe and I went to, to a conference and went, went through these sessions. And, and Desi and, and all of their infinite wisdom uh, came up with this rubric that was many, 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 many pages long. And uh, I, I want to thank Joe for uh, a lot of work that we've done over the last several years, sort of creating the, the PLC model, that professional learning community model where we hire some uh, teachers, typically through Perkins, and they come together and they sort of brainstorm and come up with a solution to our problem. And one of the problems that we had was, you know, we want to have some level of review that each academic department or each vocational program, they do internally, uh, but based on a standardized rubric. Uh, so, uh, as Joe was talking to the department heads the other day, I think most of us, as, as a board, we're familiar with NEAAC and sort of the purpose behind NEAAC, where they come in and we're allowed to sort of review ourselves as a school based on a certain rubric published by NEAAC. Uh, it's that same mindset so drilled further down into the academic area or into the vocational program area. So they're looking at uh, enrollment trends uh, within a particular program or academic area, uh, non-traditional students' MCAS scores uh, tied to that particular vocational program. You know, are there trends? Why are certain programs having higher MCAS scores than other vocational programs? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the staffing, professional development, training, so on and so forth. So it is a pretty extensive rubric, but not to the scale that Desi has, uh, which would make all of us run and hide. Uh, so I really do want to applaud the teachers that came together, created the rubric. Uh, the idea is it's a five-year cycle. So I just projected out, as not projected, I just want to display for the board. On the academic side, this school year, uh, the guidance department and then biology and chemistry will be going through their reviews. Next year will be PE and health. The following year will be history and English. The year after will be special ed and math. And then in the fifth year will be humanities and engineering and physics. And then we just continue that cycle. On the vocational side, this year, health assisting, horticulture, and cabinet making will be doing their reviews. Then it will be carpentry, graphics, and culinary arts. That is ag, mech, collision repair, and plumbing. Then cosmetology, animal science, electrical. And then finally, in the fifth year, CJ, automotive, and advanced manufacturing. Uh, and they've already gone through it, so they'll be up again. I might have missed this. It's required, I guess. It's not required. So you're choosing to do it. Correct. Okay, because you see value in the process. Correct. But I'm hearing you say it was sim the process has been simple. Correct. Okay, thank you. Simplified and sort of targeted to our school, truly what we do want to look at. And do the um, educators see value in it, would you say? Uh, I personally think so. I haven't sat at the table, but I think Joe did a great job at the department head meeting. Uh, when Ms. Sherrody was talking on the vocational side, uh, she actually talked, uh, she asked Matt to report out from the advanced manufacturing, and Joe Brewer was also at the table uh, from criminal justice. And both teachers really spoke highly of the, of the process since they've already been through it. Uh, they saw uh, it was just a chance for that, them to come together, talk about what are we doing well, what are we not doing well, and what we're not doing well, how can we ask for assistance, uh, perhaps that will drive budget decisions. Uh, but they saw like, a lot of great value. I mean, uh, so. And then lastly, uh, just so the trustees know, this is a, an annual thing. When I was principal, now Joe is principal, uh, the September faculty meeting is typically dedicated to several things, uh, one being EpiPen training. Uh, but another one is, uh, as a principal, Mr. Bianca will go through with the faculty. Uh, it's a great PowerPoint presentation that he gives around the evaluation system, uh, the timelines, the expectations, depending on what path you're on, uh, if you're professional status or not. Uh, so I, again, I just want to apply Joe for that leadership 
and making sure that we start the year off on the right foot and all teachers know what they should be doing in that particular year. So, busy month, and we've only been there for a couple weeks. <clears throat> so, the next standard is management and operations. Uh, so, just a couple quick updates. Uh, general campus updates, I want to focus on the containment animal building. Uh, the next slide you'll see a, a very quick picture of it. The external and interior framing is just about done. Uh, so if you walk down there, it's not sided yet necessarily, but it is uh, just about fully enclo uh, enclosed. If you go inside, you'll see all of the interior walls are framed out. And uh, I think it was last week or the week before we sat down with all of the construction trades uh, along with Tim and sort of outlined a schedule. Uh, our goal is to have this building done by December vacation. Uh, so between now and then, uh, working with plumbing and electrical and carpentry, uh, what can we do within the trades to, to finish it out? So uh, that work has begun. Uh, so it will be amazing when it is done. And again, that was all internal work. Uh, up to this point, typically our facilities and, and farm uh, techs have been working on it, and now we'll be handing it over to a lot of the student labor. The horticulture building updates. We had a building committee uh, just prior to this particular meeting. Just as a reminder, uh, we typically meet weekly on Tuesday mornings with SMMA. They're the design firm, uh, the architects, and uh, we're going along the process. And, and I always applaud SMMA at the full building committee. Uh, it's, it's one of the few instances where I've seen a design firm and arch architects listen to the client uh, with a feedback or request. And when we come back on, on the following meeting, uh, those requests and that feedback are displayed in, a, in an updated design. So they are receptive, they are reflective, and I think they're trying to satisfy our needs. Uh, obviously the big challenge is around the budget and money. So there's talk about earlier today, uh, they've actually sent out the initial paperwork to their, their estimator. Uh, that initial uh, cost will be coming back to the firm, I think it's next Friday. So we as internal folks will see some of the initial numbers probably early October. And then uh, my hope is we'll be standing here at a board meeting uh, in October to talk about what the estimate is for that particular building and uh, what do we do at that point. I would not be shocked, again, just as a board, as a reminder, we're looking at current revenue that we have, and that's between insurance money, the two skills capital grants that we received, uh, donations, uh, this individual community members' donations, along with Smith College with their donation, along with the earmark in the state budget from uh, Senator Comerford. All said and done, uh, we're just north of $6 million that we have available. I would not be shocked uh, if, if we get an estimate back that is around $9 million, okay? Um, so the question is going to be how do we close that gap. Uh, I do want to thank SMMA, part of their estimating. Uh, they talked about it today. There are some alternative estimates. So. Here's the full blown, this is what we want in the building. This is what we want as far as demolition. And as a reminder to the board, sort of our vision is the, the remaining existing horticulture building. The idea is we'll demo that whole area. It'll become this beautiful rotunda, maybe some flexible space for out there, uh, outdoor learning or other options. Uh, but we're actually putting everything on the table uh, as far as some of the cost estimates. What would it look like if we maintained certain aspects of that, that current facility? i.e. the garage. If we didn't knock the garage down, maybe we could use the garage elsewhere for other purposes. Would that save us some money? I don't know, okay, through you know, saving that demolition cost. The greenhouse. Educationally, it makes the most sense to move the greenhouse and the headhouse, obviously, to the new building. I don't think there would be anybody that will argue that. That makes a lot of sense. But there would be a cost to demoing the current greenhouse and moving it over, and obviously that is square footage in the new building. Would it make sense financially if we left the greenhouse and headhouse where it is and we saved it from uh, part of the new building? Now what we want to do, okay, but I just want to have all the facts in front of us so uh, as a board of trustees and as a building committee, we can make that informed decision. It won't be an easy decision, uh, but a $9 million price tag will not be an easy decision either for the board to figure out what we want to do on uh, closing that gap. So uh, I want to thank the building committee. It's, it's, it's always been some very, um, you know, uh, energetic conversations and some, some debates and a lot of questions, uh, but I think that's part of the process. I think at the end of the day, whatever it looks like, uh, I think we can stand firm that we made some right decisions. It may not be easy decisions or decisions that we all like or want, but that's where we're at. So, questions on this? Um, 
how are the horticulture students and teachers doing um, displaced um, so far? So far, they're minimally displaced. And that was part of the reason why we like this vision, <coughs> in that we're still able to use the current garage that's remaining. Uh, there is the uh, existing classroom that is still remaining. The head house is still remaining. So they're using that space currently. And if we continue down this road and we build the building sort of adjacent to the football field, then we can actually minimize the demo of what we have until later in the process. Compared to, like through the feasibility study, the idea was we we're going to rebuild on that same footprint, which would mean demoing it, which would mean displacing those, those students. So under this current vision, uh, there would be very little overlap as far as demoing and building so that the students and the instructors could stay where they are. Um, huge impact on which helps a lot of education. Are the uh, tight quarters now, or are they making do, or is it just fine? They can do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Like I said, here's a, just one photo. Uh, this is inside the companion animal building. I know it's kind of hard to see uh, referencing, but I'm basically standing in one corner. Uh, that one corner, that open space that you see in, in the foreground, would be sort of the retail intake also flexible space for a classroom space. So we're trying to keep it as open as possible. So again, as a staff person, if you're coming with your dog for the day, you bring your dog in here, uh, drop it off with the students, they would sort of do the intake processing there. But also that space would open up some flexible tables and whatnot. So we, you know, we're always at a premium looking for classroom space, related classroom space. So we thought this would be sort of that perfect uh, hybrid use for that, that area. Then if you walk through, you can kind of see a framed in door. Okay. There's two more subdivisions, uh, and those two, there'd be one, one area would be for the kenneling, okay, and then the other area would be for the actual cleaning of the dogs. So it's sort of subdivided into those areas. And then on the far end of the building, it's all framed in as well. Uh, that's where you, your utilities, your bathrooms, electrical, so on and so forth, uh, would be in that, that far back. Uh, from the carpentry's perspective, it's pretty interesting how they design. Uh, you can sort of see where we're at right now. The, the ceiling designs sort of alternate. It's not just drop ceiling throughout the entire building. It's also not cathedral ceiling throughout the entire building. It's sort of a mix uh, for the architecture perspective. But when it comes to the students getting in there and having some experience, it's nice, nice for them to see you know, different ways to design and build a building. Okay. You see that large door kind of opening on the left-hand side of the picture. Just as a perspective, that wall You'd be looking out to the MS barn. Okay, that's that side. The corner I'm standing in, I'm closer to the B building, just to give you a perspective. Uh, so outside that opening closer to the MS barn, that's going to be sort of a grassy knoll. Horticulture would be another shop. They're going to be charged with uh, building a retaining wall. So we have sort of a flat area, and that flat area will be fenced in, and that will be a run uh, for the dogs to go out and sort of get rid of some energy uh, before they're clean and kennel for the rest of the day. So. Our staff built that? They did. Are they available for the horticulture? <laughs> <laughs> put, put that out there. That might be one of our well, options. Andy, what was the cost of that building? Do you have it? 1.2, I think, total. Gives you perspective. That's 2,500 square feet. We're building 10,000. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and what, this is making me think about the other piece potentially of our animal science program, and that is the uh, city's animal control facility. What is the, uh, what's the word on that? That's a great segue. Uh, that came up in the earlier meeting. Okay. Uh, so it came up in that uh, our, the civil engineers have, have finally done some initial work on the site surveying of the, the building project. Uh, stormwater is sort of the hot topic right now. What do we do with all of the stormwater uh, to satisfy city zoning mm -hmm. laws? Uh, in order for us to capture all of that stormwater, we're sort of increasing our, our footprint down there. Mm -hmm. And would that potentially impact the potential animal, con uh, animal control facility? So we were kind of talking about what do we do? Do we, you know? So I know there has to be some conversations with Pat McCarthy. I know money is also tight for the city. Um, so what I, what I'm hearing right now is they're progressing, but I'm not sure how fast we're progressing. In sites, I think are still up in the air as well. So that's all I know. Do we have a timeline? Uh, we don't at this moment. It's you know. 
talking more yeah. than we have approval for. So yeah. trying to figure out whether there's um, an option that will be less expensive than what we're doing. And what about siting the site? That's no. one of the components. One of the you're things you're now doing. looking at other sites besides? Not necessarily, but we're just looking at all the options. Because there was an issue came up today at our building committee meeting mm -hmm. with siting the animal control facility here on how they're going to mesh together. So mm -hmm. there's probably going to be further conversation about that unless you're moving off site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which probably not going to know. So Will's on your committee, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm checking with Will. Yeah. Yes. Um, and our OPM's here tonight too. Mr. Greg Wilbur. Yes, we, we can always meet. Board of Yeah. Yeah, the, the impact, you know, one of the concerns was as we build this new, the new building, uh, just one simple fact, it's not, it's not simple, but just the, the driveway in and then the service yard, if that's either paved or not paved or whatever, and then a year or two later, we want to build an animal control facility and then we're digging up all of this new pavement to, to run utilities. Uh, so just to have those conversations. Uh, and again, I'm not saying this because I, I support the idea, but again, at this point of, in the ball game, I just want to put everything on the table as far as options. Uh, so one thing I just threw out there probably wasn't the best option, but I just want to throw things against the wall. As we talk about potential demoing of the current <coughs> horticulture building, we're going to have this area, okay, uh, and we've talked about that area being sort of a mixed-use mixed outdoor area for our students, but is that where the facility doesn't make sense there? I'm not saying, saying it's good or bad. Uh, another location I know we talked about internally is up by the VA hospital, sort of our forest, demo forest area. There's some acreage there that could make sense for such a facility. So, we're open. We're hey, was that talked about in the past, that location? It, yes. Uh -huh. So initially that's what I proposed to Mayor Narkowitz, mm -hmm. and then I think there were some issues around wetlands perhaps, I don't know, but then and talking to Tim Smith more, he thinks there's an area that's not impacted by wetlands that could be useful. Okay. Um, so we'll figure something out. Okay. Okay. So family and community engagement is the, the next standard. And uh, I just want to highlight the first newsletter that went out this year. Just so as a board you can see, this is the same thing that goes out. Okay. Uh, our goal is to have it on the first of each month, so this went out on September 1st to our school community. And the concept, I think I already shared some potential articles from the superintendent's level. Uh, I shared that over the summer that came out of our Avenue retreat. So September I focused on the importance of attendance at the high school level. So why is it important to come to school? And sort of our model here is uh, my article kicking off the newsletter would be sort of that mile high more informative, educational, okay? So I'll talk about the importance of attendance. And then as you go through the newsletter, uh, whether it's Joe or another administrator or another department, they'll kind of drill down on that same topic, okay? Uh, so then Joe got into the attendance policy. So we're drilling down into, we know, now we know why it's important to come to school, but now let's talk about what is the policy here at Smith. And then we get into some other topics you know, we try to highlight if there's any good photos or you know, media coverage. Uh, we want to highlight the fact that Massachusetts you know, passed the you know, free lunches and breakfasts. We want to highlight starting the year that we have Homework Health Club uh, starting up. Highlight the Three County Fair. Briefly, briefly outline the freshman exploratory scheduling. <clears throat> fall athletics, so families would know what's happening with fall athletics. And then the calendar that, you know, just keeping the families and communities updated, and at the bottom, contact information. So this template will be consistent month in and month out. Uh, the October one, I was just talking to Joe the other day, uh, the focus will be the, the importance of extracurricular activities. Why is it important for high school students to get involved outside of the classroom or outside of the shop? So I'll be very, again, generic at my level, and then between Joe, Tony, other assistant principal, uh, Josh, who other administrators, we can sort of dive into uh, what does it look like as far as extracurricular activities here at Smith. Really dr drill down so families know what the opportunities are. So I just wanted to let the board know that's what it looks like. 
I thought the newsletter was excellent, and um, it serves two really important purposes in my mind. One is um, informing families about how this school works. They're coming from so many different districts where every, every district is different. It's its own entity. And so to say these are, you know, you're creating that shared understanding for all the families is super helpful. And then also it serves to build community. You know, when you look at the pictures at the end and all of the opportunities that are available, it just starts, you know, connecting people to the school and to each other. And the second one, as a lot of you know, uh, we had a small contingent from the school head out to the State House last week, uh, and they were able to uh, provide verbal and or written testimony. Uh, there was a public hearing around the hoisting license bill. I just want to again give the board a quick update. Uh, we know that we have a lot of large equipment here on site. Our students are right now currently not able to use that equipment. Uh, so working through that with MAVA, we worked through MAVA to create a bill, and we actually had the Far Massachusetts Farm Bureau's Association. They were the ones who submitted the bill on our behalf because MAVA already had a lot of other edu educational bills that we submitted. So we didn't want to sort of you know, do a whole lot of overkill at the State House. Uh, so luckily, this moved to a public hearing. They had it last week, and uh, we had, I think there's three students. Uh, we had Mr. Osbach, one of our horticulture instructors. We had a parent. And we had an advisory member who also sits on the union uh, that was down there providing verbal and or written testimony. And uh, they did a great job. Uh, our lobbying firm that some of you have met, Adventure Associates, they actually provided MAV a, a brief summary of how it went. And it was nothing but positive uh, feedback. And sort of the theme that I was hearing uh, and talking to Mr. Nevin, Mr. Ansbach, uh, and just sort of debriefing on, on the questioning or the line of questioning uh, from the politicians to the students and to the teachers uh, was around safety. You know, the reason why this has become a hot topic was the concern around student safety. Why are we allowing teenagers uh, access to this heavy equipment when they can get hurt? You know, we, we should be more worried about safe, safety and student safety. That's why we don't want to allow them to touch the equipment. So the politicians asked that question very, very pointedly. And uh, the question was, in your experience, either as a student or as a teacher or whatever in your role, how many incidents in your career or in your experience has a student gotten hurt using this equipment? Every single person said zero. There's never been an injury on school grounds. The follow-up question more to the professionals were, are you aware of any individuals getting hurt out in the industry? And yes, the hands go up. Uh, and then there's a correlation, okay? Uh, individuals getting hurt out in the industry, did they go to a vocational school? Most likely they did not. Okay, because we all know that you can get a hoisting license by simply paying some money, getting a physical, and passing a test. And a test isn't about safely operating the equipment, it's more about the rules of the road, basically. It's like your driver's, your permit okay, that you get for a driver's license. Uh, so I think that really opened up the eyes of the politicians. They don't think they really realize that. Um, and I know both uh, Senator Comerford and Representative Sapodosa were both down there. They've been very supportive of us locally, and they were uh, both very supportive of the bill. So fingers crossed that we made some progress. We'll see what happens. Uh, I just wanted to give the, the board an update that we had some individuals from the school down at the State House speaking on our behalf, and they, and they did a fabulous job. Oh, oh, Julie, yeah. you mentioned you just, saw online seen, seen some of the, the pictures, testimony yeah. or pictures yeah. yeah on facebook uh they were in our uh on our smith folk instagram account oh okay. yeah and i i was cleaning up the connecticut river with representative sabadosa this weekend and um and also the person who her legislative aide, aide who wrote the language for the draft the language for the bill um she said that she'd been in touch with the gazette um, hoping that they would run a story on that. So I was I don't, I don't They know, reached out to me today. So I'll follow it up. So, be Great. so maybe we'll see those pictures. Great. Thank you. The last standard is professional culture. I just want to highlight uh, for the board the team plan for this year for our staff. Uh, revisiting the interdisciplinary units. I, I talked to some of you over the last few years. Uh, the concept behind that, we did this before the pandemic. Uh, we started with uh, different academic areas working together on common units and the same thing on the vocational side. So one vocational program, 
working with another vocational program. As an example, horticulture, keeps up talking about horticulture, and carpentry. So they would do a trip out into the woods, they would you know, identify the trees, and then they start calculating uh, what could you get out, you know, for lumber out of that particular tree. So it was benefiting the horticulture program, it was also benefiting the carpentry program. That's just one example. Um, and then, after we got through that round of academic working with academic, vocational working with vocational, we then crossed over. So the academic areas were also working with the vocational programs and vice versa. Um, the teachers had a lot of great feedback when we did, when we did this. Uh, but just realizing that staff come and go, uh, knowing that we got through a pandemic, we wanted to revisit this. So uh, that is one of the, the areas for this year. Another area uh, is the NAAC self-study work. And uh, we did receive notice over the summer uh, that they're going to be coming out March 19th and 20th of this school year for the collaborative conference. They have totally revamped the accreditation process, I think, and sort of feedback that they were losing members. I mean, we've talked about this as a board. Uh, so they're trying to make it more school-centered. Okay, back to that program review that we're doing for academics and vocational programs where that particular program is doing a review to benefit themselves. The idea is NEAC now, uh, yes, there's standards, uh, but we as a school, we're sort of doing a self-study right now. We've identified the areas that we think we do really well in, perhaps in the areas that we aren't doing so well in. <clears throat> we then have to create a plan that we say we want to work on these areas, these are our goals. Uh, they're going to come out in March to, to sort of review that plan and say, yeah, it makes sense, okay? And then it'll come out, I think it's two years after that, I believe, for a more focused review to see are we actually working towards that particular plan. So. It's more driven from the grassroots up rather than the top down. We'll see how it goes. Okay. Uh, so that's just an update. Obviously, a lot of work around that. Uh, and again, thank you to Joe and the steering committee. Uh, I think we're ahead of the ball, uh, ahead, ahead of the bell curve. We started a lot of that work in the spring. Bruce Sievers, who some of you may know, he's one of the associate directors of NAAC. Uh, he was supposed to come out last week and meet with us. Uh, there's one of those poor weather days when I think there was a monsoon down in Connecticut and he couldn't come up here to visit. But the things that he wanted to talk to us about, we've already been through and, and we've done most of it. So I, I think we feel pretty confident of where we're at at this point. And then lastly is Polly Bath uh, coming in to consult. So Polly Bath is a consultant. Uh, and she came in, I think it was last year, I'm not sure the year before. Uh, but we've, as an admin team, we identified uh, certain areas that we want some help. Okay, I, I think we have a great administrative team, we have a great evaluation process, but sometimes it's nice to have a professional consultant come in with a fresh set of eyes and observe a classroom or observe a shop, see some pros, see some cons, and then work with those particular teachers. And we all know, you know, sometimes having that new voice uh, is more impactful than listening to myself or Joe 24-7. Uh, I think she was very, very, um, Productive last year. I think she was excellent. I think her feedback was on point, and uh, we thought it was worthy to bring her back this year to continue to work with some of those teachers that we had last year as well. So uh, that's more work to again improve that professional culture across the board. What is her um, specialization? She's a behaviorist. Oh. Behavior interventionist. So she looks at students, she looks at the makeup of the classroom, um, and specifically the organization and the uh, relationships between the student and the instructor, and then is able to supply sort of those recommendations on routines, how you organize your class, mm -hmm. how, you, um, how you share information with the students, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's a pretty collaborative process that happens. Are, that's good to hear. Um, are there evaluative consequences for the educators? No. And is it voluntary on their part <coughs> or involuntary? Both. Uh -huh. So we, as, as Dr. Lincoln over said, as a team we identified, um, but then for this year we let it be known uh, through Mike Parks and through Melanie Chartier on the academic and vocational side, if you're interested in getting some coaching and feedback in this area, to let us know. So we do we do have people that opted in this year. Okay, great. And so is the involuntary assignment a, a result of the evaluate their evaluations, or is it how, how is that determined? I would say the you know how would I say uh, that it, it's more like, it's more like a symptom. Yeah. yeah. The what was occurring to the evaluation 
Gotcha. We're looking at the symptoms that might have caused that, right. and therefore we want this person to come in and work with you. Is it a consequence of evaluation? No, it's a more like a, uh, we see that it could be heading this way, yeah. so it's more like an intervention. And I'm assuming the goal is you want the teachers to be successful in the classroom, and this is what, the, what, what she will be doing. And would you say the teachers, even when it's involuntary, are still receptive to it? I'd, I'd say so. Yeah. Thank you. It's because it's, 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 it's dicey. It can be dicey, right? Because you do want your educators to succeed, and that means offering them the support that is effective and valuable, and you want to respect their professional autonomy. And in removing the administrators from having that direct interaction and coaching having helps with the evaluation, yeah. where it's not the evaluator telling that teacher, right. I saw this wrong or I saw this good, right. it removes us as well. So I think that's a positive. So would you say the educators who were on the receiving end of the coaching benefited from it? I would say and so. And would you say they feel like they benefited from it? I would say also. so. Great. Right. Thank you. So no, no donations this month. So in the news, you saw this in the newsletter, but I just wanted to throw it out uh, as far as the, the report goes. This was a picture from the Gazette. Uh, just as a reminder, you know, we hired some student help over the summer. Uh, so the, the two students in the foreground are actually twins. Uh, they were on the horticulture uh, work crew this summer. You see Mr. Nevin, uh, and this was the, the split rail fence that you see out front. Uh, I believe, uh, Mr. Brianna can uh, con correct, uh, correct me, the two female students also on the off weeks we're working with the farm under the direction of uh, Mr. Smith. So some of the construction that we just saw in that previous slide, I'll tell you the picture, they had their, their hands uh, involved in that as well. So they were here throughout the summer, did a great job. So looking ahead, just a lot of meetings. So tomorrow morning, as a reminder for the boards, uh, the first general advisory meeting in the cafeteria, seven o'clock. Uh, and then we have the BAT, again, BAT uh, represents, uh, stands for the building administrative team. That's uh, more middle level management that Joel oversees, that's his meeting. Uh, Thursday afternoons uh, is, is my leadership meeting. It's basically all of those individuals plus all of the other administrators, uh, school-wide and district-wide we meet Thursday afternoons. Uh, tomorrow evening is the back to school night for those who, I'm sorry, Thursday night, yes, okay. one day off. Uh, Thursday the 21st is back to school night which most districts will call back to school night is their open house, okay? But we call it back to school night because our open house is on the first Sunday of November where we truly open up the campus. That's more of a recruiting program for middle school students and families to come on campus, see what we're all about so they can decide if they want to apply. And then uh, next week we have department meetings. Again, two more back meetings, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Next Tuesday we're not going to have the weekly building subcommittee with SMMA, but they're actually going to be on site. And one of the ideas, uh, they're going to bring a videographer on site, and they're going to do some videoing of the program, of the students, for multifaceted reasons. One is they want to see the students climbing, the actual activity of climbing a tree. So when we really get, begin to get to the weeds on uh, designing that uh, climbing structure for the new building, the, the architects, the, the, they have a better visual of what is involved in climbing. So uh, the building can be designed, hopefully, more efficiently for the students. But we also know, and I've already mentioned it, I mention it basically every month, you know, we're going to be short money, probably going to be short a lot of money to build this. Uh, so in talking to SMMA, talking to Craig, who has some wonderful ideas, we thought, could we actually sort of expand the focus uh, of that particular video, and not only as a video for the architects to go back to their offices and study, but also design this video that we could use for marketing for this particular building project. And, and we can share this with potential donors, uh, get it out through social media, perhaps build like a separate website that we can sort of have a building website and uh, we can begin to push people, get back into the routine, hopefully donations and ideally some larger donors. Uh, I'm going to hold Craig's feet to the fire. He knows some people that may have some deep pockets. Um, so that's sort of the idea. Next Tuesday, fingers crossed that the weather holds, um, that we will have uh, SMA on campus sort of interacting with the students, but also the videographer to produce this particular video that will hopefully help all of us uh, moving forward. The following day, uh, there's a, a small team going down to, I think it's Marlboro, perhaps, uh, but DESE CTE, that's the Career and Technical Education. Uh, they want to have basically the statewide uh, powwow meeting conference 
uh, to talk about a lot of updates at the state level. Uh, so a few of us will be going down there uh, to listen to that. I already mentioned that, more leadership meetings <coughs> on Friday the 29th. Um, Dr. Spencer Robertson and I will be heading over to Gateway. Uh, I've set up a, a tour of their school-based health center. Again, they, they being the, health, the Hilltown Health Network, they are moving forward on trying to find a way to fund a school-based health center here on site. Uh, they are also struggling with the funding. I think we're all struggling with funding right now. Uh, but we thought maybe it would be nice to have uh, uh, Dr. Spencer Robinson and to get her eyes on it. So you know, as a trustee in the community, perhaps can speak positively on the impact of a health, health center here at Smith. So that's happening on the 29th. Then we move into October, we have a faculty meeting, more bat meetings. Again, we get back into the routine of the horticulture rebuild check-in meetings on Tuesday morning. Another leadership meeting, mass hire. So just as a, I should have mentioned it when Lorena was here, she, she mentioned mass hire. The superintendents in Franklin and Hampshire County, there's two vocational superintendents, myself and then Mr. Martin, who oversees Franklin County Tech. Part of the Franklin, Hampshire County uh, mass hire board uh, is vocational school representation. So there's basically a three-year cycle. So I served for three years, and then Rick served for three years. So when I first became superintendent, I happened to be up. <coughs> My first three years I served, I was able to step away. Rick took it over. His, his tenure is now up, so I am now stepping back into that seat. So the first meeting of, of this particular year is on October 5th. Again, it's just nice to have a, a voice at the table and, and see what's going on and continue to advocate for the programs that Lorena was talking about a little while ago. Are you still doing the MIAA stint? I'm on the MIA, I think you may see a meeting coming up, maybe I skip it, but yes, I'm on the MIA TMC, a lot of officials, uh, as the tournament management committee. But MABA, I'm now the past president, so I'm sort of the, the grandfather of the team now. I can just sit there and give advice. Uh, the first Friday of October uh, is typically the Connecticut Valley Superintendent's Roundtable Luncheon at the Delaney House. We had our first one this past uh, two weeks ago, uh, and Commissioner Riley spoke. In October, Russell Johnson, one of the Associate Commissioners, he sort of oversees special ed, okay, it's sort of in a uh, basic okay, uh, theme. He actually has some Western Mass roots. He was a former superintendent, I believe, at West Springfield, so he has roots to, to this area. He'll be out talking about special ed regulations and updates from Desi. Then Monday is Indigenous Peoples Day, so no school. Then we get back into our routines of all the meetings. On October 11th, the mob officers uh, will be meeting with Commissioner Riley. We do this quarterly. That same day is a student early release. So again, in the afternoon, that's where we, we do all of our professional development work for the staff. That same day, I want to thank Nurse Gardner. Uh, she was able to uh, sort of create a schedule and set up the flu vaccine clinic here on site for our staff. So uh, the staff have been invited to do this and uh, pick a time slot. We have all afternoon we're here. So uh, yes, I'm getting my flu shot that afternoon. Uh, back to more meetings. Uh, I am assuming the city will have a department head meeting on the 12th. More meetings. And then uh, right now, October 17th would be the next Board of Trustees meeting. Uh, and the Building Committee typically meets before that. I know we were talking earlier at the, the Building Committee level. We may try to set up a Building Committee meeting prior to that, more so we can talk about the estimate that has come back. We can talk about the cost and maybe have a little powwow and decision making so that I'm more prepared to stand in front of you as, as trustees on the 17th. So a lot of things happening. With that, I'll turn it back to the Chair. Okay. Sure, you're up. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I want to take this opportunity to start my report to introduce uh, the two new student reps to the Board of Trustees. Um, so, at the end of last school year, the call went out to the student body uh, for students interested in being representatives to the Board of Trustees. Um, and uh, we were able to settle on these two fine individuals. I want to introduce Dominic Sanchez, who is a sophomore in criminal justice. Welcome. He came from JFK Middle School, uh, an honorable student, plays competitive basketball year round, and uh, was selected on our varsity team as a freshman, which is a pretty big deal. Um, he's also a volunteer firefighter EMT in the Hatfield Fire Department, uh, and wants to become a paramedic uh, when he turns 18. 
And Brandon Diaz is a junior from our collision repair. Uh, Brandon is from Southampton. He's a Boy Scout and a volunteer firefighter for Southampton Fire Department. Um, he's looking to join up with West Hampton Fire Department also. Uh, so I wanted to just give you a few minutes to say hello to them before I give my report, ask any questions. Uh, they said they're ready to get fired on. My, my first question is why were each of you interested in being on the board and we're so happy that you're here. <clears throat> I'll go first. Um, I just wanted to have like an opinion on the things that go on and I want to have like, I want to make a difference mm -hmm. and I just want to have my voice out there too. Um, mine would probably be get a better student insight to everybody and also help the students essentially make an administrator level decision just by attending meetings and helping out any way I can. Well, I think the uh, opportunity for both of you in regards to coming up in, in learning and having this opportunity to meet with a full board who oversees the school and signs off on all the projects and policy as far as not only the financial side of it, but guess what guys, we're not going to be here forever. We're looking for new, new blood. So you have opportunities in your future to, uh, to be sitting in one of these chairs as well. And I congratulate you both. Thank you. And if you're at all interested in EMS as well, then Northampton Fire Rescue is always looking for folks. <laughs> so, that's just a plug I have to put in. <laughs> Mr. Bianca, I don't want to overstep what you might have discussed with them about their responsibilities, sure. but I would want to say to invite both of you to chime in with, as we're going through the agenda, talking about all of these things. If you have something that you'd like to add, something to share, if you want to ask a question, um, don't hesitate to do that, please. Like That is one of the reasons why you're here, as you both just said, is to participate, to contribute your perspectives to what we're talking about. And we do the agenda ahead of time for tonight's meeting, that you get them a copy of that, that you have an opportunity to review that, and if there's something that you, catches your eye that you want to talk about, Mr. Bianca can get you on to the agenda as well. Okay. Yeah, and I'll be meeting uh, with both these individuals throughout the month. Uh, they'll be begin preparing reports, so they'll start with the October meeting. And both of them have said that they are uh, willing, with, if the committee needs it, to sit on subcommittees. Awesome. Uh, so they would like to uh, be present and, and participate in that. Wow. That's uh, so please, please keep that in mind as we begin to form, if we do form any yeah, committees in the future. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. The rest of my report, currently we have 575 students, 119 from Northampton, we're at 20.7%. Uh, you can see the numbers there. Uh, every year at this time I, I try to go back and look at the attendance rate and <coughs> check that out. Um, I do want to say that you can see if I had left the 2019-2020 year, obviously we would have seen you know, a, a, a different number. Uh, but coming out of COVID at 93% attendance, mm. Um, you can see that at, although we dipped uh, last year, we did get back up to over 94% attendance. And you can see what really what I want to highlight is that low number. Uh, it went from 70%, which was our lowest daily attendance, to 71 to 77. So um, some of those days I can highlight and I can clearly tell you were senior skip day and junior skip day. <laughs> um, uh, but there were also things like um, there might have been snow days or, or other things that affected us. If you, if, when I look at the data and drill down, um, 177 days, we were over 90% attendance. Um, and uh, 73 days, we were well over 95% attendance. Um, <clears throat> so we'll continue to look at those numbers and uh, have conversations at the assistant principal uh, level as well as our school counselors uh, where necessary. Um, to make sure that our attendance rate continues to continues to go back to where we we know we had it pre-COVID. Hold on, Joe. Yes. Um, the low and the high. So the high being in 100 percent. So there would be days where all the students were meaning present. that was at least one day where everyone was present. Okay. And then the low is that lowest of that term. Yes. In this case, last 70s. 
So, yes. okay. And I could clearly point and know that that ended up being a senior skip day. Yeah, that skip day. Because <laughs> it, was, it was, I believe it was like May 14th or something. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you. Any other questions on that part? The, this is the average, 94.15. Yeah. I wonder what the median is. Yes, that's, I, I can find that out for you. That'd be well. cool to know. Yeah. yeah. This is, uh, yeah, the numbers are fantastic. So, Joe, since they're speaking to you in the midst of your uh, report, I just yeah. want to commend the school for having this type of a, an attendance rate. It speaks volumes to students want to be here. Mm -hmm. It really does. It's good. Thank you. That's excellent report. Thank you. Uh, we had our new story, student orientation on Friday, August 25th. <clears throat> uh, that's where the new students that are coming in with their families, they go through a series of presentations from administrators, school nurse, uh, school counselors, um, and the advisors for the ninth grade present. Uh, and then they go on tour of the campus. It's a little different. The reason <clears throat> we really hold on to this uh, day, not just to orient, I think to uh, Dr. Spencer Robinson's statement earlier about all the different students coming from different places, but uh, we did change our tours on open house to where people choose clusters. So they're only going to five. They may sign up for a second tour later in the day for another five. But we think it's important at that orientation day for all the students to see every shop and all the families to see every shop uh, because that's where we can really dedicate the, the hour and 45 minutes or so to have them see the entire campus uh, as, they, as they go. Uh, about five years ago, we started a freshman team, four years ago, we started a freshman team building day. Uh, and we did begin with an outside company uh, and then we used curriculum uh, writing uh, dollars to pay staff to create <clears throat> that team building program. Um, this year, Jackie Dugan, who's our health teacher, uh, did take the lead uh, and was assisted by Mr. Bonilla and Mr. Bergeron. Uh, and again, that's for all ninth grade students uh, to try to build that camaraderie again and, and, and team building. Um, two years ago, we started bringing in seniors that are a National Honor Society to co-run those groups and I uh, got a tremendous amount of feedback, so we've continued that model. As Dr. Lincoln Oker said, uh, back to school night is coming up on the 21st. Uh, it'll be from 6 to 8 p.m., and we'll also have a presentation on Title I and Special Education Services. Uh, MCAS, it, the embargo data did come out. Um, we began looking at that and drilling down. A lot of very positive pockets that I'll be uh, happy to share once it's official. Um, but we have begun uh, organizing our remediation for any students that haven't met the standards. Uh, and for the first time this year, using Title I funds, we're also offering after-school remediation option, uh, as some families prefer that than students coming out of uh, a different class or shop program. Dr. Lingenoger talked about the professional learning communities. Uh, that's our PLC, that's our preferred format, uh, which is using the, the staff to facilitate their own groups based on uh, varying topics. Um, again, this year, the focus will be continue to be NEASC. Uh, we gotta complete that self-study report and identify areas of growth. Uh, and then we'll, one of the things that we did also was we created a content mapping for ninth and 10th grade a number of years back. That was a school council goal uh, for all four grades, but we didn't finish the 11 and 12. And basically what that is is identifying where something is taught in a year by grade. Uh, and the hope is that and we already know this happened because English and history aligned the Vietnam War and the book, um, the things they carried, because they realized that they were teaching it out of sync. So that, that was already an impact of them being able to see globally what's taught. Uh, the other thing is part of that process was to, there's for Chapter 74 programs, part of their um, charge is to have embedded academics. So this also allows them to know who's teaching what and when, and to hopefully begin to shift some of their stuff around so that the embedded academics aligns. We know this happened with carpentry when they talk about um, slopes of, of roofs and other angles as, well, uh, math is teaching the Pythagorean theory, things like that. <clears throat> so it does have high value, so we want to finish 11th and 12th grade. Um, club fair, that's also happening this week. That'll have information in the cafeteria, and those displays will be out for back to school nights so parents can see what we offer. Uh, we'll have the college fair on October 6th. Uh, we're going to have 28 different colleges, uh, universities, and the military branches that will be on campus. Uh, there will be time for juniors and seniors on the afternoon of October 6th. They actually go through 
they have a, a worksheet with guidance that they have to fill out, so they have to actively talk to somebody. They just can't be there. It's a graded assignment within their within their academic class, um, and, and all that gets filed underneath their college and career readiness. Uh, another thing I want to highlight, uh, in 2018, Mr. LaRoe, the athletic director, and I uh, had several conversations. <clears throat> the NIA had begun something around you know student-athlete leadership training. So uh, we decided that we wanted to create a captain's handbook. Um, so we went out, we found other options. There really weren't any that we could find within the state, uh, but Indiana and other states do have pretty robust programs around student athletics. So we were able to create a captain's handbook in 2018, and we've been providing leadership training to students who are selected as captains. It's an hour-long workshop that he and I put on with those captains, and the topics that we cover are uh, characteristics that make a good leader, relationship building with coaches, teammates, co-captains, <coughs> team building, running team meetings, interacting with staff, media, and other teams, sportsmanship. Um, so this, on, a, on the 14th, we delivered that workshop to 11 first-time captains in the fall. The other thing I want to highlight is uh, last year I started the Principal's Youth Advisory Committee, and this is uh, formed each year, and there's two students per grade, as well as uh, Brandon and Dominic will sit on that. Uh, so there'll be 10 students, we meet monthly. Last year the committee did go through the Portrait of a Graduate Protocol, just like the staff uh, went through, and they were able to provide their their input on what a graduate from Smith should look like. Uh, we also went over the SPIFI data, which is uh, what we get from them around um, at-risk youth behaviors. Uh, this year we'll continue that work with the SPIFI data with the new committee, uh, and their goal is to come up with a, a positive behavior campaign um, to highlight some of the poor choices, and in, 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 but by, by positively highlighting the students that are making good choices. Obviously not at an individual level, but collectively, um, and make that an educational campaign uh, to combat things like underage drinking, um, underage drug or marijuana use would be underage, uh, but drug use in general and other poor, poor behavior choices. This year, committee members, seniors are Alex Martinez from Electrical, Jayana Daniels, uh, Animal Science, who was a, used to be a, a, the rep to the Board of Trustees, um, but her, she's so much involved in FFA and extracurricular activities that she just is no longer able to sit on the board. Becca Marks from Criminal Justice is a junior, Caitlin Willard, Health Technologies, Phoebe Perez from Electrical, sophomore, and Carlos Ramirez from Criminal, Just, uh, Criminal Justice. And then on the freshman side, we have six students applied, so we'll be going through interviews. Uh, any other questions? That's my report. Yes, sir. So could you just give us a quick snapshot of our sports teams? Yes. I'm hearing great things. Great I, things, yeah. I, I Jeff, want to share with everybody. Jeff will be here in October, I believe it is, to talk about all that. But uh, we've had a strong start uh, in, in all fronts. Um, a lot of student uh, involvement. This is always our, our highest um, enrolled uh, athletic season with all the different sports we have. So our football team is 2-0, is and, oh, and we'll have the home opener this Friday night. Um, they're going to be doing a, a campaign around school to try to get as many students as possible, but when you look at uh, boys and girls soccer and volleyball, um, cross country, very strong efforts all around. So uh, we'll present all that in October around the exact enrollments and, and where they are, but it's a pretty exciting time on the athletic side of the house. That's what I'm sharing. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I want to commend you especially on the captain's workshop. I Wow. What... Um, what a vacuum that you have filled. Um, my kids were all active in sports, and the captain, you know, how captains are chosen, it, there's so much variability in it, and the qualities uh, for why a, ca a captain is chosen, also a lot of variability. It can be popularity, it can be athletic skill, it can be, you know, um, influence, what connections sometimes even. So to, like, to bring more of a, a systematic approach to those um, to what it means to be a leader in that role. I, like we we expect people to be leaders, but we don't teach them mm -hmm. how to be. And I think this is fantastic. It's so respectful of the role those students are playing outside of school. You know, it's like taking it seriously, and it's allowing them to do a good job and also supporting the success of the team because if you have a captain who knows what they're doing the team is going to do better for sure right because it's a different role than the coach 
And I think that if you were not able to find anything like this um, statewide, that we ought to figure out how to promote this, I, like I, through the MIAA or something. So that, at our annual conference so that at the others, Cape. Or at the Cape, right? Great so idea. other um, yeah. districts can. can read that. Yeah. It's a great idea. Yeah. Excellent. Nice work, Joe. Do you want to do those committees? Sure it is. What did you see? I don't know if I told you about it. Yeah, well, you took most of my thunder. <laughs> no, uh, Dr. Lincoln Hooker did a great job um, highlighting our earlier meeting today about the building committee meeting. Uh, we got a great group, um, great personalities, spirited conversations, disagreements, but it all brings stuff, good stuff to the table. We got strong architect on board, strong. OPM on board. Um, we're certainly moving in the right direction, but I got to echo Dr. Andy's uh, concerns about the budget. That's a real concern, absolutely. Um, oh, let's see, when was it? A few weeks ago, they, we had a subcommittee meeting on that about the mechanical systems, and a lot of options were thrown on, on the table. And, and there were six options. Um, I'm just trying to highlight one of the major parts of what's going on here. And it's been pared down to three main options that are under serious consideration. Obviously, the mechanical system's gonna be a big part of the building. We're trying to be as sustainable as possible, even with, with the design, um, hopefully a timber design type of building and everything that goes in it. Um, and then um, we also have Mr. Craig Wilbur here to, I guess, give us uh, an update or, or possible vote for action on two uh, delivery formats of the project, the either design, bid, build, or what you call construction management at risk first one's chapter 149 and the CM at risk is chapter 149A, pros and cons to both of them. Um, I'm not convinced on which format to go with at this time myself. Um, when I was in <coughs> business as a contractor slash construction manager of project this size would generally go out to what we would call hard bid, design bid, build. But we need to uh, visit all the options, and we do have a timeline to spend money on too, which may tip us to the 149A. Um, so we got we have a lot to consider, um, and it's no easy task. And I applaud everybody that's provided their input and and some moments it's gotten a little heated but everybody's been respectful and uh, we've been able to move forward in a respectful manner we call that spirited <laughs> <laughs> that's right spirited right that's right um let's see what else do we and uh i think that's it for now um tim's not here for the facilities report but I was going to maybe hide. Okay, go ahead. Just, well, can I ask Rick? A, a, yeah, like, go I ahead. I ask you a question. So, just thinking about the $2 million and all the ways to be creative, if there are any ways really that are realistic, um, like, would, and thinking about the love for the school that is out in the community among tradespeople and also knowing they're running their own businesses and wanting to make money and be profitable, but wondering if we if, if we to what extent we might be able to get local businesses to donate their services i'm thinking especially like of the demolition of the, of the building. um that's that really probably not a a viable thing i think mr yeah. wilbur could uh talk a bit more about that that's more uh his expertise being being an opm um and whatever, where I thought you were going to go with that, um, not so, so much donating services, but um, funds, actual cash. Um, 
the alumni network that's loosely, I'm using that term loosely, I guess, um, they've been trying to develop an alumni association and get alumni more engaged. It's been kind of, it has been fallen on its face a number of times. Yeah. And there was, what, a dinner that was being proposed and that never came together. And uh, so, yeah, we get, we got a, a we got to be creative on hopefully um, a great idea of this um, videographer creating this video and maybe using it as a marketing tool. I thought that was a great idea. Get that out to, you know, some heavy hitters, the banks. The, we we got to, we're going to need to pound the pavement, plain and simple. When I was cleaning the Connecticut River with Representative Sabinosa, um, she mentioned the, she said that $2 million is too much for a state budget, but perhaps not too much for a federal budget, but an earmark, and suggested Representative McGovern. And when we met with Senator Comerford in the spring, she also, she also asked us if we'd been in touch with Senator, with Representative McGovern. I touched base with Andy about it, and he, yeah, he said that we aren't rural enough to qualify. I didn't know if the mayor had any different thoughts or... On how to reach um, Congress, the congressman or... And, right. Or, so, like, with earmarks able to, like, Joe was able to, Senator Comerford was able to make that earmark happen for us in the state budget. So I thought, well, why couldn't Representative McGovern make an earmark happen for us in the federal budget? I mean, you could certainly pitch it. It sounds like maybe you have. Um, you can also try the senators as well. I mean, I would, I would... Not limit ourselves? No, I don't think you need to limit yourself, but um, if you're going to pitch one senator, you need to pitch both. Of course, you do my yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm wondering if, because when we spoke to Representative McGovern so early in the process, maybe we're down here at this end and saying, look, we've got gotten all of this revenue and we are still this much short, and we have this concrete plan, and we've pared it down as much as we can. And it's a one-time expense. It's always worth asking. I, I feel like I've been told that like there's certain things that they won't do earmarks for, and con building, like mm -hmm. construction, is one of them. Why, I don't know. Yeah, interesting. But uh, that, that might be why okay. you're coming up against that real quick. And you did give us some recommendations, which Andy and I both followed up on. Right. Uh, they turned out to be dead ends, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, we're not stopping. Yeah. We're going further. But that's yeah. a definitely a good suggestion. Yeah. Anything else for community? No, I'm I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, reporting for Mr. Smith. Um, building C, the AC mini splits have been installed, and we will start the control work to tie them into the building management system. This is the phase um, engineering. This this phase is the engineering portion. Companion animal building rough construction is expected to be completed by the end of next week. Roof installed last week of the month. HVAC submittals have been sent in and approved. Final plumbing plans for our shop to you should be done by this Friday, and the students can start their project. Tim has received quotes for the new sanitary lines and sewer manhole to accommodate this building and fix the MS Barnes long-standing issues. The Apple storage repair is complete and shops can begin moving back in, into their um, storage garages. Roof inspections and repairs have been made to both A and B buildings and after many storms, um, Tim was very happy to report that <laughs> there were no leaks. Yeah. <laughs> Finishing up a reno uh, renovating a portion of the MS Barnes former locker room as an egg cleaning space and storage space. A new sink and lighting um, was added. Working on replacing the ball field fence along B building end and adding additional support so the fence can't be pushed off the poles. And I added the fobs. Um, so we, um, Josh and I will be meeting with the vendor just to go through a punch list, make sure everything's um, all set. But so far, um, I think it's been going very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments? The cafeteria um, will be um, 
we'll be asking you to vote um, for a DESE reimbursable grant for the Northeast Foods for Schools. Um, they were awarded $4,765 um, to be used for non-processed foods, and you have to use a local vendor. Um, the Northampton Tax Workout Program, I'm very happy to um, announce we have a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, she will be here through October 31st because that's the deadline. Um, she started in September and she has liked it so much. They have to get 100 hours. Mm -hmm. She has liked working with us so much. She's there pretty much every day. And she is determined to get her 100 hours in and definitely has requested to come back in January. Okay. And she has definitely been a great asset for us. I'm so happy. Yes. Yeah. Um, so last week, uh, the auditor's office and the um, treasurer's office um, completed the year-end close <coughs> um, that was completed on September 13th. Um, so once the year-end close happens, then comes the um, dreaded DESE end-of-year report, which is due next Friday. During, um, after the year-end close, the tuition, so we were able to deposit $271,961 into tuition revolving for tuition that we had not budgeting for. Um, the All right, uh, could you explain that please? Sure. So when we do the budget, um, we should be on with Dr. McGinn-Hoper and I, we do our best to yeah. get a number for tuition students. So um, once we go over that number, those funds get deposited into tuition revolving. Okay. And tuition revolving account is used for? So it's used for um, transportation. So we do have to pay for the two buses for Northampton students. Um, and it's used for other projects that the Board of Trustees will uh, Not to be... Uh... In essence, it's a capital improvement account. Yeah. It's a slush fund? It's a... It's a technical not very slush. No. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, so that's where our funds go. If they don't yeah. go back to so, the city, so they go into it's, 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 a, it's a pool of money we discretionarily use where needed. Correct. Correct. Of that. So, <laughs> for instance, um, back, I'm, I'm going to report on the multifunction vehicle that um, we had asked for back in March to be funded through the tuition revolving account. Okay, so you <clears> do your best to... So did, did you get caught in the thing that that, all right, well, if I underestimate this, I can put this money into tuition revolving because we'll have all this extra money. Uh, so, yeah, that's is, definitely a fine line. Is so that a game that... I'm, before my tenure, that was the practice for the school. Uh, and we had a larger revolving account. The downside is we have a school to run. Yeah. We have shops to equip and materials to purchase and books right. to buy. So by saving into tuition revolving we're not supporting the teaching and learning. All right, it's double-edged sword. So, but if you move too far to estimating to a T how many students we're going to have, and then God forbid a student leaves or doesn't come, we lose that tuition, or whatever, hap you know, whatever happens, then we're going to the city, which is not good either. So yep. it's that fine balance that we have that we supposed okay. to figure it out. So <clears throat> it's, it's taken very seriously. So, um, go, so the multifunction vehicle that uh, you were, um, the board approved back in March will be delivered in December or January. And what is this? Refresh my memory. Sure. The it's the it's um, the little mini bus yeah. that um, the vocational shops use or um, the um, athletics. Use. How many seats? What's its passenger capacity? That one capacity? is, I believe, that's fifteen, including the driver. And it's fuel? It's gas. Did our team take our new passenger van to Beacon Hill? I saw no, it. they um, they transported. One took a plane, and him and his dad flew. Oh, nice. And uh, the, others were, the others went with their families. So in cars. Okay, yeah. gotcha. I saw the new passenger van in, around the city, and I was so excited. I texted Andy it's beautiful. Um, we definitely lucked out with that. Um, so in um, the August 31st was our first payroll um, for the school year. Um, Anne Marie, our um, payroll and benefits coordinator, this was her first payroll run, for, and I'm very happy to report that we did not have any issues um, despite the um, Munis 
new hub system that we keep getting into issues. The um, skills capital grant. So at the end of June, um, I had submitted a, re um, a request to um, receive the funds that we had spent. And a, the form was given through June 28th, um, but we spent through June 30th. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there was no communication from the state that said that we weren't getting anything after June 28th. So I spoke with them in July, our contact, and he assured me that we would have the money before the deadline mm -hmm. of the fiscal year. Um, unfortunately, I was not having any luck reaching him after that, and I did have to have Dr. Lincoln Hunger um, assist me with reaching out to him and his supervisor. So we are currently, and I'm waiting for the treasurer to give me the deposit reports. Um, one was short $378, and the other one was $10,550. If those funds are not deposited by September 15th, it will hit the city's free cash. And that is definitely not our goal. Um, but it just, um, Dr. Lincoln Hunker knows that we worked very hard to try to connect with this individual to get the funding um, like we were supposed to. That's why we'll be off data on this week. Um, I think it's disappointing. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I'm not here to, to defend anybody. Uh, I, he has obviously a lot of skills counter grants across the Commonwealth. He's trying to manage mm -hmm. one individual. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was some other, I guess, rationale to see a house treasurer not available, but whatever. Uh, state, state treasurer should be available 24-7. Uh, but anyways, so I think it was just a lot of issues going on. And then there was a hiccup as far as what he was going to approve for reimbursement. Uh, it, it got complicated for a while. I think we're, we're digging through it. But unfortunately, we're up against this deadline with the city, and that's the last thing we want to deal with right now. But, so I did, I did notify the um, city auditor as well as during the whole process, let me just keep her update, updated so she knew what we were. Uh, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that um, it comes through in time. You didn't really need another headache. <laughs> um, so I'm very happy now. The ESSER II re um, grant ends September 30th, um, and we have um, spent that down awesome. completely. Um, Mr. Smith ordered additional filters for the school, so he was able to spend his remaining funds. Awesome. Um, can we make questions? Thank you. Yeah. Sure, so as Mr. McGuire mentioned, uh, the next motion, I wanted to have Craig Wilber, our OPM, here to, to talk to the board uh, with these two procurement options. and. Uh, I'll just preface it, that was one of the agenda items at the previous meeting, the building committee. Uh, and my hope was that we could have a conversation within the building committee, uh, talk about the pros and cons, and maybe have consensus coming out of the building committee for the, the trustees. And I don't think there was consensus, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so I think there's pros and cons. The biggest, and I'm not the expert, I want Craig to really dive into both of these options. But the reason we've been having this conversation, to be honest, uh, is around the grants. You know, we have a firm deadline to <coughs> expend these grants and hope they get reimbursed in a timely fashion. Uh, and my fear is the vast majority of our $6 million is coming from the grants. And the last thing we can afford is to lose potential grant money because this, this building project takes too long. And that's really why um, I'm leaning on Craig to give us, you know, the recommendation. But at the end of the night, it's you as the trustees have the ultimate authority uh, which procurement path we want. Uh, so that's the crux. That's, that's why we're here talking tonight. Uh, before we even have the building fully designed and everything else, we need to know what path to go. And I think Craig's going to be able to put some of the meat on a skeleton as far as why we have to start this conversation tonight. Uh, so that's why we're here. So with that said, Craig, welcome. So. Thank you. Thank you for staying. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Hopefully you guys don't glaze over and your eyes start to close. Um, is there, <coughs> is there an attachment to that slide? Oh, the two? That was on there. I think they took that PowerPoint. Yeah, that was on there. That was on their presentation, uh, Craig. It's on there. Okay. Um, there are two state procurement processes that most public monies or public buildings will take. 
Um, those two have very different uh, options to them and benefits that vary. And I'm going to talk to them as it really applies to your schedule and the money you have to spend by, by next year. Um, 149 is a mass general law that is overseen by the Attorney General and basically is your basic design bid build process. You hire an architect, they design right through the CDs, they publicly advertise it, the number comes back, everyone either says, that looks great, let's move forward, or oh my god, the number's not where it needs to be. Those are the places where I'd like to really focus and when we start talking about these different things. So for 149, you will have to wait until your design documents are complete, 100% complete. And based on our current schedule, that's going to be somewhere in January. Um, put January into effect and you put it out to bid and start looking at those time frames, you're probably looking at May or June before you've actually had someone hired. And then the contract has to be awarded. And then the contractor has to start buying their material. Material takes time. Labor right now is of shortages. So you may find that your foundation, that is the first thing, site work that has to be done. Hold on. So in the board packets, the large board back, the large paper, there's a staple packet, the very first page. Thank you. It's basically two columns. Thank you. Much easier. So again, 149A is a design bid bill, traditional procurement process that most private and public entities will take advantage of. It's a lump sum, which means you get a number, good, bad, or indifferent, and in the state of Massachusetts, you have to take the lowest qualified bid number. So it's low bid. Price it. Closed book. It, it doesn't allow us to see what's behind the scenes. Um, if you want, I like to see what I pay for. I like to see how much equipment's being paid for, how much labor, um, and be able to track that. So the people who submit their bids, their books are closed? Yes. Oh. Yes, in a 149, so yep. that's the design big bill. That's interesting. What adds time to this process is you, the owners, have to pre-qualify the filed sub-bids. So between the architect and ourselves here, we will put together packages for each, electrical, mechanical, um, abatement, carpentry, all separate packages. They go out, and then they're pre -qual we qualify those individuals. You may get six electricians, you may get 10 plumbers, you may get two carpenters, but we'll take all of those that information, we check references, we check qualifications, and then that list is created as a public document. These are all of our filed sub-bids. So think about having to review maybe 50 to 100 proposals um, from various folks and be able to qualify them. It, it's enormous amount of work. Um, we would have to do that in this case. We would mean, as the OPM architects, we probably do a lot of this, but this team would definitely have a time commitment, um, whether it be a subcommittee or not. So that's a very distinct difference between um, the two different procurement processes. Um, there's a higher chance of risk for change orders because you're putting out a, a, a static document and you're getting back a static price. There's a chance that there are things missing. Um, we hope not, we go through the process to make sure that's not the case, but it, sometimes you'll miss something and it won't be until that work comes up in the schedule that you find these things out. So I think having as much information up front with the limited time we have just makes more sense. Um, the MGL Mass General Law, which is called 149A, Construction Manager at Risk, um, they use a guaranteed maximum price, so they take all of their subcontractors that they collect ahead of time. That pre-qualification piece I just discussed gets pulled out because it goes to the general contractor and CM at risk. It does all of the sub-picking and qualifications. 
So it takes some paperwork, a little time away from us, um, and it also gives you an open book. So you see everything. Um, you'll see how much every um, subcontractor bid, what they didn't bid on, what they might have missed. The, the CM will give us all of that information to be able to determine and help decide if we want to pick our own subs. And you have that option in this case. You get to say, uh, if I want to pick my own subs, if I like a different sub, you can pick them. Um, not so much in the design big build world. Um, it needs AG approval. You have to call Deb Anderson, who's the uh, Attorney General, and get permission to do a 149A. Um, but it's a, just a simple phone call that would be made. It has to be over $5 million. Sounds like we're over $5 million at this point in time, so um, it would qualify. Some of the problems with it is it's a little more expensive, uh, 3 to 5 percent on top of your construction. So if you have a $10 million construction price, you could have $300,000 to $500,000 in additional fees. That's all going to the CM press. Um, the biggest opportunity that I see with this, uh, this, and I'm not sold on either one of these, please don't. I don't want to make it sound like one's better than the other, but with what I know for information, 149A does seem to be heading that direction. The big challenge is shortage of material, steel, wood, um, concrete labor. I'm sure you can name more, Rich, uh, electrical gears, 18 months out to get electrical gear, uh, generators, two years. It's this crazy amount of time. So anything you can buy early, whether it's installed or purchased and ready to go, will lock in certain prices that may or may not be risky. So with a project like this where things are still moving, we don't... Be honest, I don't know where the building's going yet. I don't know how big the building is. We hope we know what it is, but the reality is we need someone to be able to change and move with those significant changes. So if after schematic design, the decision was we need to go back to site E, the building E, and we need to find a way to make that foundation work, a, a, a 149A a construction manager at risk, we be able to easily shift and start looking at constructability, cost, and market uh, while we were deciding if it was worth doing. And it gives them the ability to maybe look at two things at once, where the architects are only looking at, to be honest, what they want to build. And what they want to build is what they've shown us so far, which I love. Um, can we afford it is a, is a big question. Um, and so what I was hoping for is the committee to lean in the direction to be able to vote on one or the other of these procurement processes because the work involved for me is about three or four weeks to put together the document and have it edited and proofed by everyone. Um, and we would want them on board by November. That's when design development will start for the architects and that's really when the rubber meets the road and we start looking at hard numbers really distinctive design features that we're heading towards. Um, and with a design bid build, you would have to do that again. So if you got a project and it was 10 million and you said no and you were going to make some changes, you'd make all those changes and you would have to go back through the process and rebid it again. Where with the CM at risk, you'll see it before it comes. Um, so, in general, the big differences is lump sum versus a guaranteed price that shows you a transparency and a way of seeing what's been purchased and what's not. Closed book versus open, um, a multi-step uh, pre-qualification process. So you shorten that with the 149A. Um, again, the biggest challenge I'm going to tell you is the money and whether or not you feel you can Absorb the three to five percent, knowing what I've told you today. And Rich knows this world; he's been down this path, so he knows um, as well as I do. Um, I think that 
it'll be as important to pick the site of the building as it'll be to pick your procurement process for the success of this process. So saying that, I don't know I necessarily want you to make a decision tonight, um, but I would like to, in the next month, be able to come to that decision, um, either through this group or the building committee, um, so that I can start uh, the process when we need to start. Just, if I can just chime in, uh, just to give the, the full board, uh, as I said, the building committee did not come to a consensus earlier. I just want to give sort of the, the counterpoint, and I'm not going to build over all the points, so those that were in attendance, feel free to chime in as well. Uh, but it was an architect that we have on the building committee, uh, sort of spoke out and very professionally and uh, was just talking. The counter argument is uh, with the construction manager at risk, uh, we run the risk, no pun intended, that that individual may win the bid, but then might be inclined to try to change the plans. Like that path, if I was hearing him correctly, was more, I think of like as a homeowner, if I don't have my plans really well designed and I don't really have the whole scope of what I want, I have a vision, but I don't have all the detailed plans, that construction manager at risk can help me through that process. Uh, if we have an idea, but we hire a poor construction manager at risk, we might be doing some of this if that if that contractor down the road says, I know you wanted to have this particular construction, but what about this construction? I can get it cheaper, or I can't get these materials anymore. There might be some back and forth. Uh, I think he, he raised that concern. And the question I have is just why, Craig, can you answer why that the 149A requires AG approval? That just tells me that this is something special, or maybe there's a risk that we're taking on as the owner, which is why the AG has to sign off. Do you know why that has to happen under 149A and not 149? Usually abuse. Someone somewhere along the line has pushed the envelope and used uh, CM at risk when it was too small. Um, a project of one to two million dollars, the CM at risk model just falls apart. It doesn't work well. Uh, it has to be a higher amount. So they may have had problems with developers and owners doing it and then realizing it didn't work. So what Deb will look at is the cost of, estimated cost of the project, why we think a CM at risk is needed, and in this case it would be timing, really, about timing and, fi and, and funding, and she would give her the answer based on that. I've never ever say, I've never seen her say no. Thank you for that tutorial. I learned so much from it. Um, and clearly, not clear, I mean, I could feel a, a preference. I could understand why in our situation the 149A might make more sense. And I'm wondering, um, why do organizations choose 149? To save money? Is that the main reason why? Um, sometimes it's the procurement process that's already established with the town or the, or the owner, where procurement has been based on the law plus a little bit extra, so they may add other uh, terms that doesn't allow for 149A to be used. Gotcha. Um, and, and to be honest, it always comes down to the cost. It really does. Um, most don't like to see them at risk model because it costs more money. So, so you're get you know, and the bottom line for an owner is usually the money. And the, so the higher change order risk with 149 is avoided with 149A because of the guaranteed max price, is that right? I wouldn't say it's avoided, but it's greatly uh, reduced because you have a contractor looking at the drawings from a constructability standpoint, looking for things that may or may not be missing, um, and, and therefore can give that kind of feedback early on. Um, who you hire is just as important as if you go with either one of these procurement processes. So it, it will be team dynamics. It will be someone who can work with an architect. It's not someone we want who wants to redesign the wheel and try to trample over the architect. We want someone who's a team member, and that's why we would do a qualification process first. We'd be looking for qualifications before we'd be looking for money right. number. Um, Rick, do you have a preference? My gut is the 149, but Mr. Wilbur does bring up some points. 
Uh, I think this needs further discussion, and I like to do some of my behind-the-scenes homework. I don't necessarily agree with everything Mr. Wilber said, but... Um, it's a lot of things to read. <laughs> I might have some wrong. <laughs> right. We're, we're, we're being professional yeah. here, okay? Just like our yeah. meetings. Um, you, let's you can borrow throw it on the book. table. Let's get it out there. Yep. Um, this pre-qualification process, that's already done by DCAN. You have to, each contractor has to submit their qualifications to the Division of Capital Asset, whatever management. it is, management zone. And they pre-qualify the contract, the general contractors and the subcontractors. So those people that are qualified for this scale of work are already pre-qualified by DCAM. We don't need to go through that process, okay? Um, so that's where I disagree with Mr. Wilson. Yeah, that's where we'll, you know, we can look. It's we'll, pretty, we'll, yeah. we'll work that out. Yeah. So the bottom line is, I certainly not gonna vote on this tonight, and I don't think we should. And I think more uh, discussion needs to be done on it and come up with the right decision. Because he's, he's correct in terms of, I agree with this, the added cost, and then the three to five percent, I, I, I would assume is accurate. And that is, you asked about change orders, the, the a, a guaranteed maximum price, who's ever selected as the, the construction manager, needs to cover his ass for some of these unknowns, mm -hmm. okay? And that's where, Maybe you wouldn't have a change order, but you already have a built-in change order in the guaranteed maximum price. Okay? And when you do the bid tabs, they'll do the holds and the different things. Yeah. So that's what so, we're saying. Open. So during, during with the CM at risk, you're you're, you're they're doing uh, their own budgets along the way, which they'll share with us. Um, I've been involved in that format on, on larger projects. Um, any project I did with the city of Northampton, the JFK Middle School, the King Street Fire Headquarters, Northampton High School, these were some years ago too, so the environment has changed. We're all hard bit and we're all Chapter 149. Um, and they went, well, they had good, strong architects on board, and that's another thing. I believe we have a good, strong architectural form. I think uh, the school. Andy and his, his team made a good decision on shifting gears from our feasibility architect to who we are for our design architect. Um, I was actually surprised at the beginning, but pleasantly surprised now, absolutely. Um, they're doing a, a really good job. They're listening, like Mr. Wilber said, they're listening to everybody's input. And, and bringing it back and uh, you know we had these like I mentioned earlier about the the mechanical HVAC systems options you know there were six thrown on the table and I, I was not able to attend that meeting it's been pared down to three that that even includes um, biomass system okay which uh, which some people will argue are more sustainable even though it's burning wood pellets okay um, so I'd like to do some more homework on this I think we need to have some more discussion on this and uh, I absolutely we meet, need to make a decision next month without a doubt I, I wouldn't disagree with that I or maybe even sooner yeah I wanted to ask the mayor um, have you had experience with choosing one process or the other and then I don't think so. No, I, I have not. Will and I have been talking this back and forth because yeah. he's thinking the same thing as he's going forward, yeah. what they're going to be doing for delivery method, too. I don't think the city's yeah. done to 149A in my yeah, I'd like to bring this forward. Um, as a chairperson, I'd like to table this item in regards due to the amount of discussion that's been done already. So, um, may I have a motion a second to table this item? Second. Someone has to move it first. There. No. I move that we may, uh, that we table this item. Okay. Any discussion? I got a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Second item, may I have a motion to second approval? Thank you, Craig. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around. Yeah, I appreciate it, sir. May I have a motion to second approve for discussion on competency determination for graduation? Second. 
So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, so I would like to speak to it. Yes. Two things have happened recently that prompted me to ask that this item be placed on our agenda. The Thrive Act was presented to the state legislature by Senator Joe Comerford and has many co-sponsors, including Representative Lindsay Sabadosa. Earlier this year, we trustees passed a resolution in support of it. This bill would eliminate passing the MCAS as a graduation requirement and establish a commission to recommend a more authentic and accurate system for assessing students, schools, and school districts. It will have a hearing soon, October 4th. A ballot question was recently certified by the state attorney general that also has the aim of eliminating passing the MCAS as a graduation requirement. The first petition was actually filed by the mom of a vocational student in plumbing at Minuteman. His mom said he isn't a great test taker, this is a quote, but he works hard. And he can do all this hard work and get really good grades in class, go to school every day, and be set up to do a great job at what he wants to do and still not get a diploma. I just thought that's criminal, she said. Um, so it seems like there's a good possibility that MCAS will be eliminated as a graduation requirement. Um, there's certainly momentum in that direction. So that means that um, district school committees like us will have sole responsibility for setting the criteria used to determine students' eligibility for graduation. Um, so I thought it made sense for us to review our existing district graduation standards and then give some thought to how we might want to proceed if the MCAS is eliminated. Um, so I would ask that we request a report from the administration at next month's meeting um, on what the current standards are, and then we can see where we want to go from there. Any further discussion? Thank you for bringing this suggestion forward. You're welcome. Sounds good. What we do is bring a report for a discussion. So, so to see if we can put it on next, we'll get a report from the administration next Perfect. month. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Do that. We have a motion. So there's no. There's no voting or this no. is just discussion okay. level to move forward. Correct. Right. If everyone's okay with it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. We have a motion and a second to approve the updated admissions policy. So moved. I will second it, but I will say that I wonder, is it time sensitive? Could we move it to next month? Um, I have some questions sort of about the larger context for it and would love to have um, Principal Bianca here. So the state regulation is October 1st. It has to be updated. So it can't happen. I could always ask for a waiver. Uh, I don't want to make you do that. So I'll, I'll keep, I also have some, uh, a few, uh, uh, quite a few, like, simple changes to make that I won't bring up here. But so I'll, I'll keep this really brief. Um, can you speak to the, you know, the hottest topic in vocational admissions statewide is um, should we go to a lottery? Um, and it's clear that we're not, and you had thought about it, we had thought about it, we talked about potentially moving to a lottery, so can you address that? Um, we're not, from, from what I read of the policy, we are not moving to a lottery. Correct. So can you explain why? Yes, please. Uh, I brought up at a faculty meeting, we talked about the data, our admissions data. Uh, we review the data every year. Uh, we talked about it as a faculty. And there were some concerns just locally if we jumped into a lottery. Uh, would we be truly, would we, would we continue the true representation of the students that we have if we move to a lottery? And if you really drill into the data that we have, the students that we have at Smith that are from Northampton versus the students from Northampton that go to Northampton High, the argument can be made that the students here at Smith Vocational are more diverse than the students that go to Northampton High. Uh, our special ed population uh, percentages are much, much higher, 40-something percent uh, of students here that are special ed. That is way above the state average. Uh, and just look at all the, most of the demographics, we are more diverse or more than whatever that demographic happens to be. You shared all of that with us. Correct. Correct. So by moving to a lottery, just the, the law of averages, one can make an argument that perhaps those numbers will come down. Is that what we truly want to stand behind if we move to a lottery? Uh, the second one is, the notion of selective criteria and why vocational schools are allowed to use selective criteria uh, is to uh, identify which students could best benefit from this particular education. Uh, that's why the federal government allows selective criteria. Uh, the challenge is 
identifying the selective criteria that we want to use that will then best identify the students that can benefit. That's the challenge. Um, and we feel by looking at the data and looking at the successes within the shops, and also on the academic side, um, if we, as an example, eliminate all academics uh, as a selective criteria, uh, knowing when a student comes here, most likely with an IEP, that they're going to be in the academic class only half the amount of time as a traditional high school, how can a student who is coming in potentially with academic struggles in his or her uh, educational career, then you're going to go into a high school and be in an academic class every other week, uh, let's have some criteria to make sure that they've had some success uh, in, in middle school. Uh, just as a reminder to the board, the state did update the admissions policy regulations. Now, we did, uh, most vocational schools were calling it flattening the curve, uh, where the points awarded for A's and B's are now the same. Uh, C's and D's are the same, so we're kind of flattening it where students weren't being benefited as much if they had an A versus a B. So trying to make it more equal across the playing field. Uh, discipline, we had to throw out all discipline uh, except for the major offenses that fall under 37 inch, inch and a half and three quarters. Uh, so we, we have sort of made it more equitable, but there was a major concern within the faculty that if we toss all of that out and went lottery, uh, it would be sort of counterproductive based on the data that we had. Um, so that's sort of the crux uh, of why. At the, end, the other argument is, uh, and I think some of the trustees, you know this, uh, you know, we, we received approximately 300 applications ballpark for 150 slots. That doesn't necessarily mean that 150 students don't get in. Uh, that's on the outside looking in, we can accept 150. If we receive 300 applications, then the easy answer is 150 are told no, and that's not the case. The 150 are put on a wait list. Uh, the first 150 are offered an acceptance. The ball is now in their court. Now they can decide if they want to choose to come here or not. And not all 150 choose to come to Smith Vocational for whatever reason. They stay in the home district, they go to school choice, they do whatever they want to do. Uh, so as we, re we receive word from 150 that some of them are not wanting to come here, we send out more acceptances to 151 to 160. And we go through that round and not all of them are going to say yes. And we go to 170 and 180. And before you know it, we're down into, uh, well into the 200s. Uh, so whether it's a lottery or selective criteria, we're still getting all, almost all the way through the applicant pool to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, so the argument was, why get rid of the, the selective criteria? At least allow us to sort of rank order the students and go through a more methodical process uh, to fill the class rather than a truly random mm -hmm. assignment. Uh, so that's question. where we stand right now. Quick question. Uh, so if you go the direction of lottery, are you planning on weighting it so that you have uh, kind of a skew in terms of the different groups or uh, demographic groups that you're trying to equalize? The recommendation would be not to go down that road. Uh, the recommendation is one school uh, that did move to a conditional lottery, and uh, they used uh, is a student eligible for acceptance? And that basically meant looking at discipline as an example. So if, a, if an applicant had those major offenses, then they weren't eligible for the lottery. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, um, they were basically allowed to get in, they were put into the lottery. Uh, what I would recommend if we move to a lottery <coughs> would be to maintain the priority, uh, back to that term, for Northampton students. Um, so because Northampton is our in-district school, uh, right now the current policy is that we accept the first 30 students that we accept come from Northampton, no matter where they are in the ranking. Uh, now typically we have more than 30 students from Northampton that are in the top 150, so it's a, it's a new point. But hypothetically that policy means if number 30 from Northampton is actually 170th overall, we're taking that student who was ranked 170th first because they were the first 30 in Northampton. So we want to make, make sure that Northampton is being served uh, as a priority. So if we had a lottery, I would recommend some language through the lottery that the first 30 students would come from Northampton through the lottery. Um, but beyond that, there's been no discussion as far as prioritizing certain demographics or whatnot.
Is that based on who applies first, or are you are there other criteria that make them ranked in that first thirty? Uh, there's a deadline of uh, March 15th they have to apply, so then we rank after March 15th. Uh, if a student applies after March 15th, we, we score them, but then there's other issues with, around tuition forms or whatnot, but they would be moved to the bottom. Um, so they get, so Northampton still gets scored, you just take the, the top 30 scores and then you keep them. Right, so the 300 applications a lot of them are from Northampton, so they're mixed in, in the 300. But before we offer anybody anything, we go, we look for those first 30 Northampton students mm -hmm. offer acceptance. Um, and chances are, well, you see that the enrollment, you know, we have a lot more than 30 students from Northampton every year. Uh, we just want to guarantee Northampton those, those slots. Mm -hmm. Because historically, I think, you know, we're ranging from 20 to 30 percent of our enrollment is from Northampton year in and year out. So we thought let's just build that into the admissions policy and make sure that we're maintaining that ratio. I did my dissertation study on school choice in Northampton, and that number is remarkably consistent from 1970 on. It's a, it's right around 20 percent. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the motion and second here. Yeah. Um, you. You know what's happening, and you have a really great sense of what's happening in other vocational schools in the state, um, and also what potentially could be happening um, in the legislature. Can you speak to that? Like, have other vocational schools, have more schools moved to a lottery system? Have the ones that have done it backed away from it? And what do you think the legislature is going to do? Yeah, so there's the one school I referenced moved to the conditional lottery, and their data improved. Excuse me, what do you mean by conditional? There was some criteria of, that, of ethnic group or? Not ethnic group, it was the discipline was their condition. So uh, applicants so had to not okay. have the more the, severe. The more severe discipline Correct. issues, okay. But that was the only condition. Correct. Okay. okay. Uh, there was a second school uh, that had a, a part lottery. So they had the selective criteria for the first percentage of their applicant, of, of their incoming class. And then I think they saved X number of seats at the end, and they used whoever was not accepted through selection criteria, they were thrown into a lottery, and they filled the, the end, um, which skewed the numbers if you think about the demographics. Uh, they did that wrong. But um, those are the only two schools in the state that moved to a lottery. Uh, if you talk to more of the Eastern Mass regional vote techs who have 2,000 applications for, you know, Few hundred slots. Uh, they have a very large wait list. They're digging into the data and they're finding a lot of issues around the the, the lottery that could potentially happen. Um, take a regional vote tech. That means they have regional agreements. Mm -hmm. Typically, a regional agreement means they have uh, each town has a certain number of slots guaranteed. Guaranteed. Yeah. How do you deal with a lottery? Um, are you having individual lotteries for each of the member districts? Right. That causes other issues. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, there's no, we, issues we, around the data that is being advertised uh, as far as what is a completed application. So mm -hmm. some of the opponents to the selective criteria is talking about how many applicants we have. Mm -hmm. They're basically trying to increase the number of the wait list. Um, but they're considering a completed application simply a student who submitted their name on an application. Mm -hmm. The Department of Ed is calling that a completed application. That is not a completed application in logical sense. So there's just, as you dig into the data and you dig into the arguments, it becomes weaker. Even though on the surface, I think we're all educated adults, I think we all can see the value of a lottery. It, it eliminates any bias. It seems to be the most fair. Uh, that's the easiest argument to make. But as the schools are digging into the data, that's where the concerns are coming in. And, and that's why I think the state Initially, they, they kind of pushed it through the, the budget process. They backed it off when they realized, the Senate President herself realized there was a deeper issue. Mm -hmm. She removed it from the state budget discussion. Um, if the state decides a lottery is a lottery, we'll, we'll go down that road. But I, I just think as a local school, we, we saw other issues and in, in why tackle that right now. I think what, what we have, and we've, adopted, we've modified the admissions policy, as I said, kind of flattening that curve, uh, not looking at all of the discipline, attendance is, is different. Uh, we actually eliminated the interview, which was, I think, contentious. I think some people saw the value of an interview. You think as a vocational student, you know, you're going for a job interview, you may want to have an interview. 
uh, we felt internally that an interview could be biased. Mm -hmm. The amount of training that we would have to have our interviewers go through to make sure that they're unbiased depending on the student sitting in front of them. And if that student was an ELL student and has difficulty speaking in English to an adult, uh, that could cause some type of intimidation. And would that student score as high? Is that fair for that student? So we eliminated the interview. Uh, we use that more if we have like an appeal process at need be. Uh, so we've tried to make it as equitable as possible. I think our data represents it. Um, so I think as a team, we felt pretty pretty solid staying by the admissions policy as as we updated last year. Uh, this year was some just minor. We weren't changing anything in spirit. It was more just some, some of the formatting and some of the glitches that we had. Um, so. Thank you for all of that context. And the policy is really um, clear and well written, easy to understand by the right person. Okay, I'd like to call for a vote. We have a motion and a second to approve the updated admissions policy. Any further discussion? I, I just want to ask Dr. Lincoln Hooker, can I meet with someone in the guidance department to go over some of those changes that like typographical changes and formatting changes and is, is yeah, that you'll be with you? With you? Or with you? Yes, okay. that's, that's easy. Perfect. We have a motion and a second to approve the updated admissions policy. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve a new revolving account for lost technology. Can somebody tell me what that is? Sure. So for the wonderful new box that we have, if somebody loses it, we have to replace it. So there's a $7 charge for that, which is what the, the actual file costs. So we need to put it into a special account. So when we do re, um, replenish them, we will replenish them from the account. Or if somebody happens to find their fob, um, we would reimburse, reimburse them to that account as well. So okay. we need a motion to second. Move to approve a revolving account. Second. All in favor? All in favor. Okay. All right. Aye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> I was waiting for the other sidebar discussion. No, I, well, it was actually, I asked the question. No, no. Asked the fact no. about is it only for the fobs or is other devices? And so right now it's just the fobs, mm -hmm. which means that it could extend out to the other so devices. So you want to there. change the language and keep it so you lost fobs? So the language is for? Lost technology. Lost it technology. Is so it's generic. So it's a correct. generic. So anything that would be technology. But do we want to right? If they lost motion. the computer, that's technology. Correct. So it could apply. It could apply. Correct. So, do we want do, do we want the revolving fund for just the fobs, or do we? Want it should be lost technology. Technology. Lost technology. Mm -hmm. right. That's so the. So we want is that the motion that was made. Yeah. Okay, good. So we want it broader than just the fobs. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. The, but the the motion is for the account for lost technology. You would rather have it be broader, crystal. Yes. Um, I don't think it needs to be broader. That that is broader. I think that's I think that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, it's generic. It's so broader than just five. Right, right. That's correct. correct. Okay, okay. Correct. so that's and that's okay. correct. And that's what you want. Correct. So students lose more than the fobs. Correct. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> they didn't. Yes. As of right now, yeah. Um, because we do, you know, we have other revolving accounts. Okay. Or um, other like so a broken would be or restitution accounts. So, so it would be used for all kinds of technology. Correct. Okay, I didn't realize that. Right. Yes. So we, so we have a motion and a second. Yeah, All in right. favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Next one, we have a motion and a second to approve e-payment of FY23 invoices listed in the financial report. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 We have a motion and a second to approve to surplus for scrap slash disposal expired COVID tests from the school nurse in Pulse Oximeter from the Health Technologies. So moved. Second, sir. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Next item, future business tomorrow. Everybody bright and early, 7 o'clock at the Elvis Best Restaurant if you want to come to the General Advisory Committee. October 17th, the building committee, I know you talked, you may change that date, but we'll put it there for now. October 17th, regular board of trustees, 5 o'clock here in the library. October 25th, program advisory committee's meeting, 
6 p.m. in the cafeteria. November 21st, 23 building committee meeting at 3 o'clock in the library. November 21st, regular board of trustees meeting here at 5 o'clock. And may I ask this young lady to my left for a motion to adjourn? I make a motion that we adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.